Isn't it amazing how two people can have totally different reactions to something? For instance, people can look at the same piece of art and have a different reaction. People can listen to the same piece of music and just have different reactions. Even people can watch the same football game and go in opposite directions. For instance, in my life, my wife loves musicals. And I have to be honest, I'd rather be poked in the eye with a sharp stick. I like scary movies, but my wife makes me wait until after she's fallen asleep to watch them. I do not like shawarmas, even though everybody swears if I try theirs, I will. And I promise you, I won't. Growing up, there used to be those pictures that had those hidden images in them. And some people would spend hours staring at a picture trying to see that 3D dolphin while other people could walk up to it and see it within seconds. In fact, all this reminds me of a video I saw not too long ago of two brothers that had different reactions to the same news. Watch this with me. And guess what the doctor said? What? It's a boy. Buddy. But guess what? It was a girl. It was a girl, and it's okay. They thought it was a girl, but it's a boy. It'll be okay. Don't you want a baby brother, too? I don't want a baby brother. Now that reaction was funny and it makes us laugh. I mean, it's pretty hilarious how crazy that kid got over finding out he was having a sister instead of a brother. But you know what? Sometimes we hear things and sometimes we can look at the same thing and the different reactions can cost us something. For instance, somebody might hear about an opportunity to invest some money and they'll jump at it while someone else might look at it and say, you know what? That sounds just too good to be true. Some of us, we can hear a politician talk and man, we can get on board with what they're saying and it can really move us while other people hear the same exact words and hear nothing but lies. Speeches throughout history have shown that some people are moved to go all in on someone while other people run as far away as they possibly can. Words have a way of being divisive. And here we are in week two of the last words of Christ. The words that he spoke while he was hanging on that cross. When we look at these seven sayings, they're not all found in one of the Gospels. In fact, they're found in all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we look at those four and we see how they work together in harmony and through study and history. We put them together in this pattern. We put them together in the order that we think that they happened. And those seven sayings speak to us. In fact, let's remind ourselves of what they are. The first one is this, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do, Luke 23, 34. Last week, we looked at this statement and we talked about how we all need forgiveness, how forgiveness is so permanent, how it's so necessary in our life. And the them that Jesus is referring to actually is me. And we see that in there. We see that we are part of them. We need that forgiveness. Then the second one is today, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. In Luke 23, 43, it goes on. The third statement is this, woman, behold your son. Then he looks at John and said, uh, behold your mother in John 19, 26 and 27. The next statement was, I thirst there in that next verse. Then Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We see that in Matthew 27, 46. Then the last two statements are, it is finished in John 19, 30. And then the last statement we see is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit there in Luke 23, 46. And as we think about these words and how words can be divisive, and as Jesus spoke these words while he was hanging on the cross, we see really that the cross can be divisive as well. See, there's two types of people that come to the cross. Those who think it's foolish and that it's a waste of time. But then there are those whose lives have been changed because of who hung on that cross. And today we're going to look at two guys that had opposite reactions as they hung next to Jesus on crosses of their own. And we examine these men and we examine their um, reaction. We can't think, but help think what kind of response does it stir in us. 
Does it make us uncomfortable? Does it stir up feelings of organized religion or maybe stuffy services that we sat through as a kid? Or maybe we look at that cross with fondness and we're thankful for what that act delivered us from. What response do we have to the cross? Does it cause us to have sorrow in our spirit for what the Lord suffered? Or do we see just another man hanging on a cross dying? What is our response to the cross? Maybe as you listen, you really have no response, but your indifference and your lack of response is a response in itself. So as we step into this story today, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, how does this cross affect my heart? How does this cross affect my heart? And I ask you today to be honest with yourself as we look at this story, as we think about this statement that Jesus made, these last words and the weight that they carried that Jesus made on the cross and see how it affects us. But before we do that, let's just take a minute and ask God to speak to us today through his word. God, today we're grateful for your love for us and we're thankful for what you've done for us. God, thank you for the sacrifice of your son on that cross for our sins. Because of the love that you showed for us, we can have a relationship with you. And God, I just ask over the next few minutes that you would remove distractions from our life, that we would focus on scripture, that we would hear what you have to say to us through your word. Lord, we'll thank you for what you say and how you work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have a copy of the scripture, maybe on your phone or or a hard copy of it, turn in your scripture to Luke chapter number 23. We're going to be in Luke chapter number 23, and we're going to start with verse number 32 today. Scripture says this, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It goes on to say this. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. It continues on. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is king of the Jews. In this passage, we see Jesus hanging on the cross, mocked by the crowds, mocked by the soldiers, mocked by the rulers, hanging between two criminals. Around them stood a crowd that really didn't understand what was happening. There was so much irony going on here. The irony of Jesus saving another but not himself. The irony of being mocked as a king by those who were hurrying to crucify him so that he would not become a king. The irony of being accused of blasphemy by those who actually were committing blasphemy. The irony of wanting to kill the person That was the reason for the Passover, just so they could hurry up and go celebrate the Passover. These two hanging on the crosses next to Jesus weren't just common criminals. Some translations call them thieves, but these weren't the kind of thieves that just broke into someone's house and took something or in someone's business and took something. No, these were thieves. These were criminals that more than likely had committed a capital offense that had killed someone in the act of robbery. These were men who deserved what they got. There was no crowd clamoring for their release. There was no one standing there hoping that they would be let down off the cross. In fact, there might have been people there watching them die, glad that their lives were being taken. Or maybe as they died, if Jesus hadn't have been there, maybe there would have been no crowd there. Maybe there would have been no one watching them die except the soldiers. We just don't know. But this mocking goes on and we see in Luke 23 and verse number 39 where it says this. One of the criminals who was hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. 
See, this criminal was all about the show. He wanted the miracle. Maybe he had heard the miracles that Jesus had performed. Maybe he had heard of him raising the dead and feeding the 5,000 and calming the sea. And he said, listen, if you are who you say you are, show me. Prove it to me. Take yourself off the cross. And oh, by the way, take me off the cross too. It hit me this week as I was thinking about this message and studying this passage of scripture, the irony in the fact that this man is hanging there, dying. Going through the pain of suffocation. That's what the cross did to someone was it suffocated them to where they couldn't breathe anymore. And he's sitting there suffocating to death, but he has time to mock the son of God. How crazy, how ridiculous is that, that he's hanging there dying, but he's taking time to mock the guy next to him. That was not lost on the other criminal. In fact, he said in verse number 40 of Luke 23, he said, the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and says this. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What an exact opposite of the reaction of the first criminal to the second criminal. He looks at him and says, listen, buddy, we deserve what we're getting. We're hanging here because of our crimes. We're getting what we deserve. But this man is hanging here as an innocent man. He's getting what he doesn't deserve. He saw the sign above Jesus' head that said, King of the Jews. He understood who Jesus was. He was starting to comprehend that there was something different about this man hanging there. Maybe when they first were hung, maybe he was part of the crowd that was mocking Jesus. Maybe he went along, but as he observed Jesus, as he saw what was happening, he understood something is different about this man. This isn't just a normal man. No, this is Jesus. This is King of the Jews. And so what happens is we see Jesus make that statement of truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Imagine Jesus grasping for breath after being beaten, after having the crown of thorns placed on his head, after being worn out trying to carry that cross to the place of the skull. After those nails being driven through his hands and through his feet, hanging there suffocating, struggling for every breath, struggling to get the words out, and yet he's able to show compassion to a thief, to a criminal who didn't deserve it. But why was the one criminal's response so different from the others? Just a few feet away, they're watching the same thing happen here. Why did he respond with repentance when the other responded with rejection? Why was he focused on his future while the other was focused on the here and now? Maybe it boils down to the way they were looking at Jesus. Maybe it boils down to the condition of their heart. And so we see Jesus speaking to them. And what we want to do today is we want to rewind that statement that he made. As we step into it, we're going to start at the end and work our way back through it. And we're going to see what Jesus told him. See, the end of that statement are the words, in paradise. When we look at this, we see the where of Jesus' answer. The criminal recognized the kingship of Christ. He wanted to be a part of the coming kingdom, but Jesus gave him so much more than that. He said, I'm going to give you paradise. Paradise appears two other times in Scripture. It appears once in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians where Paul was talking about, hey, I, I knew a man that, whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but uh, he was in paradise with God. And he heard things that he couldn't talk about, and he saw things that he couldn't talk about. And then in, again, in Revelation chapter 2, we see uh, paradise mentioned where it says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in Paradise, the paradise of God. This idea of paradise, because if you continue to read the book of Revelation, you see that the tree of life was in the heavenly city. And so paradise is referring to heaven. And Jesus is promising heaven to this criminal. Paradise. 
heaven, a place with Jesus, a place of beauty that has a street of gold, that has gates of pearl, that has uh, no more pain, no more suffering. It says in Scripture that God will wipe away all tears. A place where we will see followers of Christ of old, where we'll never die. Scripture tells us that even now Christ is there preparing a place for us. But this paradise is not for everyone. Because not everyone will go there. Those that don't have a relationship with Christ, those that haven't given their heart to Jesus, will not be in heaven. In fact, Scripture teaches us that they will be in hell. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse number 8 says this, In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Make no mistake, there is an eternal home for all of us. Death of our earthly body is not the end, but just the beginning of our future. Historians and archaeologists tell us that this place of the skull, this place that they were being crucified, more than likely was the city dump. It made it easy for the Roman soldiers to discard the bodies. They would just cut them off the cross and let them rot there for the birds to eat. And in the middle of this landfill, in the middle of this dump, the criminal found paradise. So what is our response to the where? What is our response to heaven? Are we looking for escape or are we looking for forgiveness? The first thief, he just wanted to escape. He just wanted off the cross. Just take me, save yourself, Jesus, and save me. Get me off this cross. He didn't understand the consequences of his decision and the place in hell for him because he did not have that relationship with Christ. But the second criminal was looking for forgiveness. He was concerned, and he understood what he had done, and he understood the consequences, and he knew there was no hope for him. But because of what Jesus did through his death and his resurrection, he paid the price for that criminal just like he paid the price for us. So again, I ask, are we looking for the escape or are we looking for forgiveness in our life? How many times have we taken advantage of what Jesus has done for us and just look for an escape instead of looking for that forgiveness and being truly repentant of what we've done so that that relationship can be restored? So we see the where, but now let's see the who. Jesus tells him that you will be with me. The real comfort, the real change was the presence of Jesus. Jesus makes the ultimate promise to this criminal that his position has changed. He no longer is viewed as a criminal, but now he has a position in Christ. Jesus didn't look at what the thief could do for him. In fact, The thief would never do anything for Jesus. He was hanging on a cross to die. There would be no service from his life. There would be no glorifying God with the rest of his life because his life was about to be over. Yet Jesus understood that his need was to be with him. J.D. Greer once said this. He said, Christian, conversion is not a change of circumstance. Life just doesn't suddenly become smoother or even primarily a change of behavior. You don't immediately become a perfect person. It is a change of status, a change of position. You are now identified with Christ. Jesus was giving something so far greater than anything this criminal could imagine. He was giving him an identity that he had never had because the criminal saw Jesus for who he was. He wasn't looking to Jesus just to get out of punishment. He saw Jesus as something to be treasured. He understood that this was an innocent man dying on a cross. This man didn't deserve what he had. And so when we look at the cross and we see the who hanging on the cross and we think about Jesus, do we see Jesus as useful or do we see Jesus as beautiful? John Piper said this, he said, sometimes we treat Jesus like a tire iron. A tire iron is necessary. We need it when we have a flat tire, but when we don't need it, we hide it away, we stow it away so that no one can see it. We only bring it out in emergency. How does our heart affect our view of Jesus? Is he a part of all of our life? Or is he just the break glass in case of emergency type 
tool that we pull out when we need them. The greatest result of the cross is not heaven, but the presence of Jesus, not only for our future, but also in our present life, in our here and now. David understood this when he wrote in Psalm 103, he said this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Be reminded today of all that Jesus has done for you. Celebrate the love and the mercy that he's shown you. Let your heart be encouraged by the beauty in his life. If you know Jesus today, celebrate him. Don't just use him for your needs, but celebrate the beauty of Christ in your life. So we see the where in paradise. We see the who with me. But what about the when? It's right there at the beginning of the phrase. It says, today, today you will be with me in paradise. It was right then. The criminal was asking for something in the future. Hey, someday when you make this your kingdom, when you take over this, will you remember me? Jesus said, listen, I'm not only going to remember you then, I'm going to remember you today. He promised him a relationship today. There was no hoops to jump through. There was no standards to meet. Just coming to Jesus with a humble attitude and realization that he was his only hope. Imagine the conversation these two are having over the mocking, over the doubters, over the people making fun, over the haters. The criminal was able to shut out the outside noise so that he could focus on the voice of Jesus. While the other criminal doubted what Jesus could do, this criminal was desperate for what Jesus was offering. See, in the first criminal, doubt caused delay, but in the second criminal, desperation brought salvation today. He was desperate for what Jesus had to offer. He understood that today was the day. I've grown up in a Christian home. My dad's been a preacher all my life. He's still a preacher today. When when my dad was about 26, 27 years old, he became the pastor of a church in Southern California. And it seemed like God was blessing in that place. The church was growing, the community was being affected positively by what was going on in that church. But something was off with my dad. And during that time, revival services were popular. Maybe you've grown up in church and you've had revival services. That was when a time a speaker would come in and stay for about a week and you'd have special services and he would speak each night. And the speaker came in and preached on salvation. And there on the front row, my dad became convicted of the fact that he wasn't saved. Yes, he was the pastor of a church, but no, he didn't know Jesus as a savior. He'd never given his life completely over to him. And so for six months, my dad struggled with that because he was afraid of the consequences if he accepted Christ. What would the community think? What would the congregation think? What would his wife think? What would his kids think? So for six months, my dad wrestled with that. Six months later, another evangelist, another preacher comes in and he speaks. And he preaches on a Sunday morning and he says the topic of of his message was be sure you're saved. And every question my dad had was answered. And my dad sat there and he knew that today was the day. If he turned Christ down, if he turned the Holy Spirit down there, there would be no other opportunity. Today was the day that he needed to accept Christ. And so during the invitation at the end of service, he came forward. He shook the evangelist's head and said, I need to get saved. The evangelist was taken back a little bit. He said, listen, I don't need someone to pray with me. I know how to do this. And he got down on his knees right there and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior because he understood today was the day. Not tomorrow, not yesterday. Today was the day. See, Scripture teaches us that. Today is the day. Joshua wrote in Joshua 14, he said, if it seem evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. He said, working together with him, then appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day. If you're sitting here today listening to this message, let me challenge you that today is the day to give your life to Christ. Today is the day that Jesus wants to be a part of your life. 
And if you're running from him, if you've given your life to him, today is the day to give it back. Today is the day to stop running. See, the where is heaven, the who is Jesus, and the when is today. How does the cross affect your heart? Some of us, it may have at one time, but we've become cold toward what was offered in those last words. When we come to the cross, we need to ask ourselves, are we looking for escape or are we seeking forgiveness? We have to ask ourselves, do we see Jesus as useful or do we see him as beautiful? And then we have to ask ourselves, do we have doubt or do we come to him in desperation? When we look at the cross and we see Jesus for who he really is, then we can have that relationship with him. And today, if you're listening and you've never made that decision in your life, let me challenge you to make that decision today. It's as simple as sitting there and talking to God and saying, God, I know that I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I believe that you're God. And I want to thank you for your death on the cross, for your burial and for your resurrection so that I could have a relationship with you. And today, I give myself over to you. And for us that have made that decision, if you made that decision today because the day is the day, man, we want to celebrate with you. We want to answer any questions that you might have. We want to encourage you in any way that you can. So if you would do us a favor, we would love to hear from you. One of our staff will reach out to you. If you would just text the word Mile City to the number that you see on the screen. And this week, someone will reach out to you and will answer any questions that you have. But let me encourage you and let me let you know that Jesus loves you. And that he is the answer to your problems. And his presence in your life makes your life better just because he's there. You don't have to do anything to earn that salvation. He gave it to us freely.